by purposefully and intentionally playing the game of Dungeons and Dragons in a specific way, we help them grow and we help them build skills that then allow them to build friendships and other relationships outside of our groups um, and out, out into the real world. And we're not just a couple of yahoos. Um, I have a master's in education with a specialization in drama therapy. Um, and I've been a, a group facilitator for over a decade now. I've been playing Dungeons and Dragons since I was about eight years old. I am a yahoo. <laughs> but I'm also a licensed marriage and family therapist. Only one yahoo. Okay. <laughs> just one. <laughs> I'm also a licensed marriage and family therapist um, and have specialized in uh, seeing geeks and gamers in therapy. And I am also a gamer for a very, very long time, I guess. I don't know. How old am I now? 20 You're 20 at that age where you start forgetting <laughs> 25 your 25 years. Um, so that's us. I'm curious about who's in this room with us. So raise your hand if you are someone who plays role-playing games. I figured I would see that many hands. It's, um, a, good, it's a good crowd. <laughs> keep your hand up if you are uh, someone who is a, a game master. That's your primary role. Okay, awesome. That's good to know. Um, now, now, put your hand down. Now raise your hand if you are someone who thinks that games, role-playing games specifically, but any kind of game, has uh, in enhanced your life in some way. Improved your life, made you know yourself better, know your yeah, community better. That's so cool. Awesome. That's why game to grow exists. Um, I'm curious also, is there anyone in the room that uses games uh, to help other people? Maybe a teacher who uses games, a therapist who uses games, uh, anything like that. Fantastic. Librarian, awesome. anything. Anybody who's using games to help their community. Fantastic. So what we're going to do uh, today is we're going to talk to you about how games of all kinds are good for you, how they enhance social growth, how we use them very specifically to address uh, social skills, what we call deficits, though I hate that word, um, address social skills needs for enhancement, and then also give you some take-home tips. Whether you're someone who wants to help your community specifically with D&D, or whether you're just a D&D player who wants to, to know yourself better and enhance your game. We're going to go through all of that. Um, let's start off with why RPGs are good for you. Um, we uh, we, we uh, came actually five years ago uh, to speak at Emerald City Comic Con for the first time, and uh, we were talking about why ro role-playing games are good for you, and we've gone over and tried to enhance our list bigger and bigger and bigger, and we've basically come back to the main four um, that are really, really important reasons. There's so many reasons why role-playing games can help enhance your life. Uh, the main four that we come back to again and again and the way that we use role-playing games with our uh, participants is these four things. Perspective taking, frustration tolerance, creative problem solving, and cooperation. So we're going to go through these uh, one at a time. Now, it's worthwhile to point out, when we talk about why RPGs are good for you, we should at, le at least sort of define RPGs here. What we're really talking about is games like Dungeons and Dragons. That's tabletop RPGs um, that you play. You're sitting down at a table. You're getting face-to-face -face interaction. Um, you're doing social sto storytelling games together. And when we talk about these four particular skills, we're saying you're going to get these by sitting down at any table um, with other people who are at least welcoming and warm and create a, a, a safe place for you to play the game in. So as so long as you've got that, you're building these skills. That's just going to happen already. What we do that takes that a step further is we use them much more intentionally. We, we take those things and say, how can we really intentionally focus on this particular skill or create something in the game that's going to um, build skills uh, with a lot more intention in that particular area. So we'll go over kind of both things, the benefit you have and then how you can take that a step further when you play it with intention. The, for the first one, um, perspective taking. This is built into a game like Dungeons and Dragons. Any kind of sit-down tabletop role-playing game where you're playing a character, this is... This is perspective taking. You're playing a character who ideally has some different thoughts, feelings, experiences, desires than you have. So you're already working on this skill when you're sitting down and playing a role playing game. Um, one of the things that I always love about uh, thinking about perspective taking is the incredible dynamic that you have at the table um, around this. You're not just playing a character and having to think in the perspective of your character. There's also all of these other people at the table who are also playing characters and having to think in the perspective of their characters. And you're playing a game cooperatively with all those people. So you're having to think in the perspective of the other players at the table and what kind of game they want to play or what kind of experience they want to have at the table. But then you're also thinking about their characters and the kind of interaction that your character is going to have with their characters. So the depth of opportunity for perspective taking, for thinking about other perspectives than your own is incredibly varied within a game like Dungeons and & Dragons. And a lot of our participants struggle with autism-related challenges, and 
it, it's one of the diagnostic criteria um, for, for autism is some difficulty understanding theory of mind, which is what uh, the, the basic principle that perspective taking is based on. So let's talk a little about theory of mind. So theory of mind is basically like a, um, a psychological term for the development of understanding how other people can have different thoughts, feelings, and desires than your thoughts, feelings, and desires. This is a common thing that we develop as human beings as we get older. Um, we actually aren't born with theory of mind skills. Um, in fact, we develop them around the age of, of two and three. We start to finally start to realize, oh, maybe that person over there doesn't know exactly all the things that I know. When babies cry, they think you know exactly why they're crying um, because they don't have any ability to have a different perspective than that. They don't know you don't have all the same knowledge of them as them. One of the tests for this that I absolutely love is called the unexpected contents test. Um, the way that they have figured this out is they basically have a box of candy and they turn around to a, a child and they say, what do you think is in this box? And the child will say, candy, because it's got candy labeling on it and it looks like candy. And then they'll open the box and the box will be filled with crayons. Um, and then they will say, um, if I close this box and I ask your friend over there, what will they think is in the box? And children who haven't yet developed theory of mind skills will say crayons because they assume that the child over there has the same set of knowledge that they have. Um, whereas ones that have developed that skill will instead say candy because they know that they're going to be fooled by the exact same ruse that this stupid psychologist has, has told them. <laughs> so this actually is a skill that we continue to develop for, throughout our entire lives. Um, even into well into adulthood, even into well into old age, we, we continue to have to build strides towards theory of mind skills. Most of the time you see this when you're out driving and you're running late to a con where you have to do a panel and someone cuts you off in traffic and then you're like, how dare you cut me off in traffic? Don't you know what hurry I'm in? I'm important. That's theory of mind skills. I, I don't necessarily understand that they don't have the same knowledge and perspective that I have. And you know, if I sit and think about it, obviously I know that. But in those moments, I don't necessarily have those skills. So when you are thinking about your perspective taking, when you're playing your game of Dungeons and Dragons, you're a player at the table, you can think about how the opportunity is there for you to have some empathy, both with the other characters at the table and with the, the character that you are, you are interacting with. And we do this a lot of the time very intentionally in our games. Um, we have a sort of a running uh, encounter we've used a lot of times where uh, the players are in a dungeon and there is a ghost that only one of them can see. And the ghost knows the way out of the room, but the ghost is only willing to tell one person. So then the players all have to, I mean, I'm playing the ghost, so all the other people at the table know what the ghost is saying. But we have to say, well, your character doesn't know that. Your character can only know it if that character tells your character. So then there's like this fun, uh, starts off fun, and then they get frustrated kind of uh, uh, conversational loop we have to go through. Um, but that's, that is a way that we can very actively work on, OK, my character doesn't know that. And then the person who can see the ghost tends to be like, uh, the ghost says you're stupid. <laughs> no, I know he didn't say I was stupid. I saw Adam right there. Adam didn't say that, but well, your character doesn't know that. <laughs> um, or uh, we'll do things like, uh, literally, I think a week ago, um, we had, um, I had my players have to solve a cipher, uh, solve a very specific puzzle. And one of the player's characters is illiterate. So I said, uh, even though you solved that puzzle in five minutes, you can't help your teammates because your character is illiterate. Um, but then we had an interesting conversation around how do you help people without helping people, without telling them the answer. Um, so there's lots of different ways we can focus very specifically. You had a, um, a, st a, where you had a silence spell or something like that. You had to do the miming. Um, so in one instance, I had uh, the players were coming into sort of a workshop, but it was filled with um, artisans who were evil. They were evil artisans. Um, and they were all um, like sort of hand-to-hand -hand monks. And when the players came in, um, the artisan workshop was filled with all sorts of um, different uh, ways of doing stuff. There was somebody like chiseling away at, at, at statues, doing, doing sculpting. There was somebody who was forging weapons. And so in order to make the workshop not an incredibly loud experience, they had installed these silence lamps that hung from the ceiling. So the entire workshop was filled with the spell silence. Um, when the players came in, they realized there was no sound whatsoever, which didn't impede the evil artisans, but absolutely impeded the players from being able to cast their spells. So one of the players, they rolled their checks, they made their observations, and one of the players could tell that these were silence lamps. 
but had no ability to explain it to any of the other players. And so all the next parts of the game were basically them trying to gesture to the other players what these things were in, in the air that they needed to, to destroy in order to, ruin, to get rid of the silence spell. Um, but of course, the other players were forced to then say, how would you interpret that gesture <laughs> if all you do is point like this? Um, and one of the players goes, wow, wow. I, I, I go, yeah, let's get them. <laughs> we should do that. Um, and so most of, that, most of the rest of that combat was actually spent um, with the one player trying to knock out all the, all the lamps and all the other players just going like, I don't know what they're doing. I'm just fighting these, these artisan guys. Um, so perspective taking is an important skill uh, to be able to have. And u- ultimately, all those players had a great time in that combat by using the skill of perspective taking, by understanding um, that it is more fun sometimes to misinterpret but even know that you're misinterpreting. Um, that's a perfect segue to the next one we're talking about, which is frustration tolerance. Because um, for every time that players love that, there's also plenty of players who hate that. Um, and it's important, though, however, um, to have a little bit of frustration, to have a little bit of challenge, because that helps you overcome uh, things and then feel successful in, in doing so. And that is how we build skills. We build skills by overcoming challenges. If everything was easy all the time, you wouldn't learn anything. So it's our job to, to make that game frustrating just enough, scaffold it just perfect, so that they can feel successful. Because the feeling of, I did it, is the feeling of uh, uh, learning and accomplishing a skill. Now, it's worthwhile to point, here, to point out here that when you're building skills, you have to hit a sort of middle ground in between it being too easy and it being too hard. If uh, whatever activity you're doing is too hard, you will give up very quickly. Um, you will not feel you're making progress. You won't feel that, that you had an, even an opportunity to be successful. Whereas if, an opportunity, if, if something you're doing is too easy, then uh, you'll also give up because it will become boring. Um, the real secret is that it has to be hard enough that you felt like you could have failed, but easy enough that you were still able to succeed. Um, and that's essentially what we do in the game. We want to make sure that the game is scaffolded in such a way, this is a term from education, um, we, we help support or, or um, uh, help increase the challenge depending on the level of need of each player. Um, and doing that allows them to feel challenged and then successful. And there's actually a, a running joke in one of my tables that a, a two is the worst role, not a one. Because one is always like kind of fun and interesting, uh, and twos are like, well, okay. Um, <laughs> and uh, that's because it should be fun. It should be a, a fun to, to struggle. It should be fun to feel challenged. And um, we, one of the most important takeaways in life, I think, we can gain from a game like this is that failure is not the end. Um, failure is just an opportunity to try something else. Um, in one of the games, I had my players um, looking in a, a storage closet for a secret door. And the player got a critical fail. And instead of finding the secret door, he found a box of endless pineapples. <laughs> Not useful um, at all um, until, well, until later when he realized that pineapples were the answer to every single problem. <laughs> um, be careful what items you give your players. Um, <laughs> I'm going to fill this room up with pineapples now. <laughs> it works. It's, it's prickly. <laughs> yeah. um, so ultimately what we want to do is we want to lean on the opportunity that Dungeons & Dragons already has for failure. Um, you know that you can roll low, and those low rolls can be a big part of it. Um, but we want to use this and create challenges that then have a chance for you to build those skills. Fit, uh, frustration tolerance is a really important social skill because it's frustrating to talk to people. Um, it's frustrating to try to figure out how to communicate. Um, it's frustrating as an adult. Um, and if I don't have the skills for being able to go, <sighs> let's try this again then I might flip the table or I might run away from this interaction. And so being able to build an understanding that I can fail a little bit, I can struggle through something, and I can still come out the other end, and that benefits me ultimately in that process. And a lot of the players in our groups um, struggle. They struggle with uh, that frustration tolerance. And so um, improving frustration tolerance for young people also means that they can stay in school a little bit longer. Uh, They don't have to have as many office referrals or times they need to go see the the counselor. So there's a very direct direct consequence for building that skill is you can spend more time in school, you can spend more time learning and then participating and getting more social experience with friends uh, at recess if there is still recess left um, as schools are getting rid of recess. I used to be a teacher, so I have lots of feelings about the value of recess. Um, 
And what, I mean, one of the ways we do this is, as we, we talked about roles and how important roles are, but we also um, make up a lot of stuff that makes the game really challenging um, on purpose. Uh, one of my favorite puzzles is what we call uh, the lava puzzle. And the lava puzzle is a room that is slowly filling up with lava. That's it. <laughs> what do you do? Um, and that's so, such an important time. So that the kid, when the kid's at school and, and they have a math test, a pop quiz, they say, well, pop quizzes are terrible and I hate this, but Gragnold got out of a room that was filling up with lava and I'm Gragnold and I could handle that so I can handle a math test. Yeah. Come on, how much, how much worse, worse is a pop quiz compared to a room filling up with lava that you're in? Right? It's comparable. <laughs> All of it. Um, and the, the, like we talked about, the lava, the lava puzzle really is an opportunity for them to be creative, to think outside the box. And that brings us to creative problem solving. Um, there's different types of challenges that we as game masters can provide our players. Um, so creative problem solving is something that we really like to lean into. And part of the way that we do that is that we want to think about puzzles in a couple of different ways. Sometimes a puzzle has an explicit solution. If I want to have a riddle in my game, it probably has an explicit solution. We don't use those a lot, um, partly because what happens if they don't get to that solution? Now you're just stuck waiting for them to figure it out. Um, what we like to use instead are, are these sort of open-ended challenges or open-ended obstacles. Um, and we have one that we really like to use a lot um, called the lever puzzle. I know I said puzzle, it's a lever open-ended challenge, whatever. <laughs> um, the, way the, the way it works is this. Um, the players have, uh, the characters have walked into a room, and you can see that the walls are covered with dust. Um, they're all made of stone. The walls and the ceiling and the floor are all made of stone. And across the other side of the room is a wooden door with metal portcullis or bars that are down in front of the door. And in the very center of the room is a giant lever connected to the floor. And they pull the lever, and then uh, gears churn in the floor below them, and then the walls next to them, and spikes come down from the ceiling, and the ceiling starts slowly lowering towards them. And that's all we have planned for this puzzle. So from that point forward, what the players do is all in response um, for, for the Dungeon Master. The Dungeon Master will just respond to whatever it is the players are, are putting in front of them. So um, we've had people solve this puzzle all sorts of different ways. Um, we've had people search for magical blocks in the walls that are hiding a control panel, um, or um, just try to rip the, the, the walls out or the lever out of the floor and try to jam stuff into the gearing. Um, we've had people fly up into the air and jam pineapples into the, <laughs> into the ceiling. It got really gummy and it stopped the spikes. <laughs> it worked. Um, one of my favorites was uh, the players all collectively decided with, with uh, this player's permission that they would pick up the dwarf character and just bash him into the door uh, until they could make their way through. He had a good helmet on. He had a really so. solid helmet. <laughs> no um, brain damage. Ultimately, we want to provide the opportunity that this puzzle can be solved any number of ways. Um, and not every solution is always going to be successful. This is where we use, use a, a, a term we call failing forward. That's actually a, a term commonly used in the RPG community. Um, and failing forward basically means even though I might not be successful, I still learn something, I still move forward with the plot line. So when the wizard says, I look, look for a magical block um, that might control, uh, have a control panel behind it, and I might say, okay, roll an arcana check, and you rolled a two. The most boring roll. Um, but I would say, um, you don't notice, uh, none of the blocks are magical, but you do notice um, that the screws and the lever on the, on the floor seem loose. So now I haven't allowed them to be successful in what they were, or, were trying to do, but I have given them something to help push things forward, something to help you know, uh, continue to move the, the group in a, in a positive direction. We always want to provide that opportunity. And we oftentimes give more uh, success when the players are working together. It's sort of a, a little hidden dungeon master trick that we use in our groups um, that th things tend to be more successful if our players are cooperating or working together, which is, uh, believe it or not, the next slide of my slideshow. Um, <laughs> so uh, the, the game of Dungeons & Dragons, it's a fellowship game. It's, it's a game where there is a team of adventurers ideally working together towards a common goal. And we have uh, some very specific table rules at our games around players are heroes, players are working on the same team, um, players cannot play the same class at our table because it's very important to really build this concept of, of cooperation that we're working together on the same team. 
if we rely on each other for different things. If there was a team where everyone was a strength-based fighter, then that might be kind of boring, and there might be a little bit of competition between players to figure out how to solve a problem. And what we really want is for players to say, hey, uh, this, this door is locked. Rogue, come over here. I need you. So then the player who's playing the rogue gets to feel included and involved and invested in the story. Um, one of the ways that we really like to think about this is the difference between um, cooperation and collaboration. Now, um, when, you, when you bring somebody else uh, um, over, you have them use their skills, you rely on the, the fact that they have a 20 dexterity and you don't. Um, that's cooperation. Those are great skills. But we want to take that a step further often and turn it into collaboration instead. And collaboration is taking an, an individual idea and adding to it in such a way that you create something greater than what either, either idea or either person could have created on their own. So we can do this in a couple of different ways. We do this by in designing the, the scenarios in the game. So we have like the kind of example of uh, there's a king, and he's, he's an evil king, um, and he's got a key on his belt loop. He never takes it off of his belt loop. And your opportunity here is to uh, get the key off of his belt loop, but he's giving a presentation at a gala. So it's, it's going to require teamwork to figure this out. Um, one person can't go over there and punch the king and take the key. That's not going to work. Um, but the wizard might be able to make a distraction, and then the bard could make a distraction, and then the other guy could make a distraction, and then finally we can, we can work together and make this happen. Um, there was a pineapple, this is a, pineapples have been the theme of this, uh, this presentation, but there was a, a pineapple breakfast buffet um, that distracted enough of the gala goers so that they could uh, sneak in and get the key from the king. Um, those are the kinds of things that we can build into the encounters, and, and you as a game master can do this too. Um, if one player is, is uh, uh, particularly good at a skill, add in an extra skill that they don't have so that they're going to require somebody else to work together to solve that problem. So you can do this by, by focus, focusing on the encounter level, but you can also zoom out and do a lot of world building and collaboration with your players as well. Um, we've actually given, given several panels and talks um, uh, at different cons about um, doing world building with um, the entire audience. So building an entire world uh, with hooks and plot lines and interesting stuff in the world and a map all with the audience. Um, but one of the methods that we like to talk about, and that, those videos are actually up on our, on our YouTube channel, and you can find them at gametogrow.org. Um, but one of the methods that we like to use for it is called the Ouija method. Um, and really quick, I'm going to do a Ouija, and we're going to name, uh, let's say, a town uh, with the audience right here. Um, so what I want you to do is all at once, I want you to all shout out single individual letters. Hearing lots of cues. There's always cues. Okay, I've got a B T Q P S. How would you pronounce that city? <laughs> Done. <laughs> now, now the city of Batacupus um, can be a city that that lies in our campaign. It can be a place that we all go. What's great about this is that obviously it's a goofy name and it's fun, uh, but it's also a name that we created together. We all have ownership of this name. Um, and whenever you do stuff in the world where you, where you collaborate towards making something together, everybody gets to have a little piece of that ownership. Everybody gets to have a little piece of what's, what's going on there. And you feel like you made that as a group, not just as an individual. And we can do this uh, one step farther. We can name our villains um, with this Ouija method, and then everybody has that ownership over your plot arc entirely. Um, I have lots of like kingpin-style characters that I've incorporated that are like overarching bad guys who have their fingers in lots of, of pies all over the all over the kingdom, and like they have legacy. A Stony Uguye was one of our one letter at a time made villains, and that was like six years ago, and he's still sort of plotting and, and pulling strings uh, behind the scenes. And th the, one of the reasons why he's so important and so valuable is because they made him together. Um, we can also do things like we, we name a town, and then we say, like, everyone in this town has a kind of a particular um, fashion thing that they do, and it's kind of a unique uh, thing that they do here. It sort of makes this town a unique place. Um, what is that thing? Can I ask you what that thing is? Yeah, no, what is everybody in this town? What, what is the thing that they do? 
they all wear ties. Yeah, like everyone wears ties in this town. Um, and, and then I can yes and that. I'm like, and, and the length of the tie really depends on your age. And every year there's like this birthday party where everybody gets a longer and longer tie. And so you know when you go in there, that if you see somebody with a really long tie, you have to be really nice to them because they're really old. <laughs> and, but like we've just built a world where there's people have long ties and they get to walk in there and then they get to see that city that they helped create, that we built this thing together. And that's another one of these feelings that's so, that's so positive. It's not just what I can do and what you can do, but once you said ties, now we're in a place where everybody's got ties. In the city of Bat- Batucupis. Yeah. <laughs> uh, and, and you can take that and go as far as you want to. Sometimes like, I'll get out my, my notebook and, and make up one th- things one letter at a time. And you know, that, maybe that's not always the right thing to do. But it's a good way to get some engagement and, and help us all feel like we're participating in the same story. Um, I, it kind of reminds me of the Big Agatha story, Adam. Um, so one of my favorite... Uh, times that we did this. Um, it's a thing we've used a, cu- a couple of different times in various different campaigns. We, we tend to homebrew most things very specifically for every group, um, but we have a couple of different things we've repeated over the, over the years as we've been able to splice it into different campaigns. And one of them is um, the players are going through a dungeon, and then before they go into a room, I say, before you open this door, and then I put my Game Master screen down, and then I talk to them about um, a fairy tale they heard when they were, their characters were children. You all heard about this particular ancient legendary troll. What was that troll's name? And then we'd go around and we'd name it. And it was named Biagafma, and Bia, which is a fantastic name. After a while, you start getting vowels in there once they get used to this. Um, <laughs> Uh, Mostly, it's hard to keep pronouncing words without vowels. Yeah, so. lots of Q's and X's for, for the first couple of years. <laughs> um, and then we got, we got Bia Gafma, and then I, my Game Master screen is down, and that's sort of the signal a lot of the time that I'm just going full-on well, um, collaborative homebrew world. And um, I said, what is, it, what is a story your character heard in childhood about Bia Gafma? And they were like, well, my village, and they can make up anything. There's no rules here. Uh, my village, we learned that uh, Bia Gafma... Uh, eight children who lied to their parents. Oh, okay. And I'm writing all of this down, and that's a really important signal that I care about what they're saying. Um, the next person, well, I heard Biagafma. My uncle used to make me like, go bury offerings to Biagafma in the woods. But I think he was maybe having me bury something else. <laughs> <laughs> all right. I'm right. <laughs> well, um, and deep, deep insights, right. by the way. <laughs> um, yeah. Uh, layers, right? This is all good stuff for me. It in- encourages the development relationship with the character. It also um, gives me stuff to play with. And then I, they, we all finish doing this whole thing. I put my Game Master screen back up. They walk in the door. And then before them, in a cage, is none other than Bia Gafma. And Bia Gafma looks over it, and, and, and I do a lot of voices. Well, hello. Look who's come to play with Bia Gafma. <laughs> And those players still talk about Bia Gafma. That was now uh, like five years, six ago, years six ago, years ago, something yeah. like that. And Bia Gafma still comes up. Yeah, um, those those hold a lot of water. They hold a lot of opportunity. Um, those are the stories that are going to stick with you for years and years and years, um, and that you will always remember and come back to. And you'll remember the people you played with when you made those stories. So all of these things we've talked about so far, these four things are inherently built into most role-playing games. And if you're sitting down to play them, you have an opportunity to build any of these skills. We've given you a a couple of tips about how we specifically uh, do it as a game master. We focus on those things. Um, And uh, the next part of the uh, the conversation that we're going to have with you is uh, about social skills. There is definitely this, uh, this idea that kids should be learning social skills. And social skills are something that have to be taught. And um, how many of you feel like you um, learned from other people? Well, you learned social, how to be social from other people, people in your community. That's, that's how oftentimes we learn naturally. We learn social skills by uh, the social learning theory. We see somebody else try a thing, and we try that thing. Or someone, if, we, if we're not learning that naturally, we have a little bit of coaching from the community. We try something. It might not work that well, and then we learn how to do it better. So we want our games to be as much as possible a natural setting for people to learn and cultivate their social capacity. Social skills is the, the things you know, and your social, social capability, your social capacity is how well you can do that thing. Um, it's a, like a subtle nuance, but a lot of parents and a lot of teachers um, who don't understand the difference will want to make sure their kid knows skills. 
But if the kid doesn't know why that skill is valuable, they won't use that skill anyway. So it's important when we're talking about how we use these games to build social capability, there's really three different types of, and I told you before, I don't like the word deficit, because our, our groups are very strengths oriented, um, but this is a, a based on a theory. So if you're looking at someone who needs to build their social capacity up, there's often one of three reasons or a combination of three reasons why um, they haven't quite gotten up to that um, appropriate level of social capacity yet, social capability yet. One of those is knowledge deficits. Um, there, there are uh, knowledge deficits, performance deficits, and fluency deficits. And those are um, three different um, ways of understanding why someone may not be fully capable of interacting um, at the level that we might want them to. Um, and knowledge deficits are when they literally don't know the skill. There's a lot of times where young people, um, they haven't, they maybe have been under-socialized. So they don't understand the value of eye contact. You might say, eye contact is important. Here's how to shake a hand, make a good first impression. We might have learned that from a parent or at school at some point. Um, but to assume that everybody has a knowledge deficit is uh, kind of a, a a big problem, because a lot of kids don't need to be taught things. Um, they know the thing, it's just uncomfortable. I don't want to do it because I don't like doing it. You t teach me to make eye contact, eye contact's awkward. I don't want to make eye contact. So it's very important to understand why someone doesn't want to make eye contact. And that would be a, a performance deficit. If someone knows the skill but doesn't want to do it, then that's a different way. You don't need to teach them to make eye contact. They already know it. And oftentimes our participants have been in social skills training programs for a lot of their life, and they don't need that anymore. What they need is an opportunity to play a game with other people where they can actually interact and have a good time and then feel the reasons why it's important to interact at all. The third one, the fluency deficit, is when someone knows the skill and they try the skill, they're just not quite good at it yet. And those three, what are called deficits, um, have very different reasons and ways that we as facilitators um, intervene. So someone who has a knowledge deficit obviously must be taught. And we can do this in the game a, a number of different ways. Um, what's so interesting about a game like Dungeons & Dragons is that we don't teach a skill and then incorporate it in the game. We actually play the game, which is an opportunity for skill necess uh, the necessity of a skill to show up. And then we can teach a skill while it's really, really valuable, and then they can immediately use it and then feel the benefits. Um, a great example of this is um, a group that I had more recently that was uh, trying to get an, uh, a non-player character, um, basically their sentence reduced from a trial. Um, and so the players showed up um, acting as the attorneys. Um, and we had a whole mechanic for how they made their arguments and for how they, they approached the whole thing. There was, in this case, in, in this city, there were a series of multiple judges that would all be presiding over the trial. And so the players had to uh, figure out what the qualities were of each judge um, in order to best understand how to form an argument that would appeal to that particular judge. So their, their um, values might have been family or... Um, justice or uh, personal power, and so the players had to figure out what, what, can I, what kind of argument can I put forward. Um, but in order to do this, we had to actually have a discussion about how you make arguments and how you attune to different people. And so the first thing we did was introduce the mechanics, and then the second thing we did was have a discussion about making arguments. How would you create arguments in order to defend somebody in a trial? And then once we had those, those pieces outlined, we could go through and have them actually make their arguments. Um, Funny enough, one of the players purposefully tanked all of their arguments um, in order to uh, be in character because they were playing a barbarian with um, a negative one modifier on their intelligence. So they, the, <laughs> the assumption was they couldn't figure it out. <laughs> um, but, but it worked out great. They, they tanked the arguments. It was hilarious. And then the other two players had to kind of pick up the slack um, and, and fill in the gaps. Uh, but all, the whole time they had basically picked up these skills and picked up an extra set of essentially tools they can use um, for the future. And then they can get the immediate feedback for this skill is valuable in this context. So we, we introduce the need for a skill and then present the skill as the solution to that problem instead of vice versa, which is a subtle difference, um, but an important one. Um, performance deficits, as I said, are when someone doesn't use a skill and they might be uh, under-socialized. It might be that, that, that uh, school has been awful. They've been recipients of peer victimization or bullying, and they don't want to interact with other people. They'd much rather uh, be in an electronic ecosystem where they don't have to interact with other people, or that the interaction can be turned on and turned off at will, so you don't really have to navigate a lot of that unstructured 
structured social space that can be so challenging. So performance deficits we respond to with encouragement. And that can take a lot of different formats. It, it, Dungeons and Dragons and other types of role-playing games are so fantastic because the game is more fun and you get farther mm -hmm. along in the story if you're working together. Our sessions are 90 minutes each. So if we spend 20 minutes arguing, that's a big chunk of the day. So now we can, uh, once again, sort of introduce the, the skills or intervene in a way to help them uh, um, interact to more, more skillfully and then reinforce pro-social behaviors. And then we are then encouraging being social. Adam and I sometimes talk about the difference between intrinsic benefits and extrinsic benefits. Um, an, an extrinsic benefit is when um, I offer you a piece of candy for doing something. Um, you rode your bike. Um, I wanted you to practice riding your bike. Here is a piece of candy. Um, that, has, that has benefits and that has opportunity. It's actually a, a common behavioral technique. Um, but intrinsic benefits, which are harder to foster, um, often will carry a lot further. An intrinsic benefit is an internalized idea for why this thing that I'm doing is valuable. Um, what Dungeons and Dragons does for social social growth is that it creates an intrinsic benefit. I'm not playing Dungeons and Dragons and trying to get along with my teammates um, because I'm going to get an extra piece of gold if I do that. I'm doing it because it's more fun to do it that way. It works better. I'm going to have a better time, and everybody else at the table is going to have a better time too. That's an intrinsic understanding of the value of socializing, something that is very hard to teach without actually having a fun social activity that you're doing together. That being said, we do sometimes give out inspiration. Or candy. Or candy, <laughs> if it's useful. For a lot of people who are very, very under-socialized and really need a lot of extra support, we can really allow um, sort, of, sort of the hand wave of the game master to make things successful if they're working together. Um, one of the uh, creative problem-solving things we did um, in one of my campaigns is they needed to um, steal something from a moving wagon. And what they did is they made a fake car wash. So the cart, cart wash. It was a cart wash, right? a wagon wash, washeria. And um, that was like a, a brilliant idea, and they were working together. And I didn't say, like, where are you going to get the buckets? Why do you have hoses? Right, like, uh, but uh, it works. Uh, and here's some inspiration for working together. And they made a business. They also made some, some gold while they were waiting for the right wagon to come through. Um, um, the third type of deficit is a fluency deficit. And this is someone who wants to be social, who likes the idea of interacting with other people, and they try to use skills, and it's just not working. And this, uh, the response that we have to take as a facilitator on this is to coach them. This is where feedback comes in. They don't need the help doing the skill, or they don't need to be taught the skill in order that they do it. They're doing it. They're trying it. And this is where uh, feedback is really important. And that is they like, I see what you're trying to do here. A lot of normalizing and then having conversations around this. So this is where we as, uh, we talked about reinforcement a moment ago. And this is where um, oftentimes we have to attribute as the game masters the intent. So we have to understand someone is trying to get some sort of need met. What is that need that they're trying to get met? And then attribute the best possible intent with what they are doing, and then try to coach them to do that in a more effective way. So it's, it's a very subtle difference between these three types of deficits and the game master role, especially a sort of uh, therapeutic game master role, is one where you have to have so many eyes and so many different directions at the same time. Ultimately, most players who come in who are having trouble socializing, who are socially isolated, who are having trouble making friends, have a, a mixture of these. Um, it's pretty rare that anybody is solely one of these areas. And so a lot of what we're doing is we're, we're crafting different things in the game to give an opportunity for challenges to come up, for players to tackle those challenges, and then for us to respond to the wherever area of need they have with what, what needs to be in the moment. Um, but a lot of it as a, as a facilitator and as a therapeutic facilitator is assessing what area do they need the most help with here? What way am I going to intervene uh, or, or to help out um, in this particular situation? And that brings us to things you can actually do in your game. So I, all the benefits we talked about, other than the way that we use the games very specifically in our sessions, um, are things that you can get in a good and well-run game. So now a couple of things you can do at your own game table to make it more enriching. Um, raise your hand if you are someone who uh, uses a session zero. Session zero, awesome, about half of you. Um, so for those of you that don't know, a session zero is a conversation you have about the game you want to play. Oftentimes this happens before the first session, which is why it's called a session zero. 
but we advocate that you do this kind of conversation on a regular basis. Um, have, have session zero um, regularly, um, session uh, zero before every session, after every session, whatever works best for your particular game group. But the idea here is that you have a conversation about the game that you want to play because a well-facilitated <coughs> game gives you opportunities to build all these skills. There's some tools that we like to give out and that we like to utilize in our own games um, around session zero. It helps to have a specific time period that you've kind of carved out and you said, hey, we're going to talk about the kind of game we're going to play. Um, and some of those tools are tools like um, the X card. Is anybody familiar with the X card in their games? Oh, awesome. A few people. So the way the X card works is that it's a great tool in the event that you feel like your players might become overwhelmed during your game. Um, the, the X card is literal. Um, uh, three by five card that you put on the table that everybody has um, with an X on it. And basically the card stays uh, face down for the entire game, but in the event that ever, anybody ever becomes overwhelmed, uh, maybe the topic of, of conversation that's happening in the game, maybe the, the events that are happening in the game, or maybe just I got a text from somebody and that is an overwhelming experience that I'm, I'm now facing on my own, uh, I can flip over my X card and that means that I am taking a break from the game. I'm going to step away from the table, I'm going to be away from, from the experience, and everybody at the table all has an understanding that if you flipped over your card, that means you are overwhelmed, and so we're, we're not going to overwhelm you further. Um, we're going to give you the space to step away and the opportunity to step away, and you can do so without being worried about what's going to happen to your character or being worried about, about missing stuff. Lots of dungeon masters will use the X card to say, um, if you are feeling overwhelmed, flip over your X card and the entire game will be on pause. We will take a break. Nobody will ask you why you flipped it over unless you want to volunteer that information. And that is just an opportunity where we say, oh, okay, we're going to take a, a five minute break. Um, let's everybody re up your snacks and your drinks. Um, though that is uh, an important tool that you can establish early on for everybody to then have at their disposal. And in the session zero, you can also do what I sometimes call uh, please lists or no lists. Um, sometimes referred as black lists or white lists, but um, a no list is something that you definitely don't want to have in your game. If something, including something in your game is going to cause you to not have a good time or to have a trauma response or something like that, it is important to have a space where you can advocate for that. Um, so that it doesn't come up and then a player has to tell the game master, interrupt the game with an X card or something like that. If we can establish a safe space to have these conversations, then that can happen there. So what we do is we hand out a three by five card and have players write no at the top and then write things underneath it that they do not want in the game. <coughs> Oftentimes this will look like sexual content, uh, cursing, slavery, uh, homophobia, all these kinds of things are things that you don't want to have in your game. Let's have, let's have a world where you don't have to worry about homophobia. Just just for 90 minutes a week. Let's just, let's just live in that world instead. Um, that's a, a thing that a player wants to advocate for. I'm all about it. Um, the, other, uh, the other, and oftentimes that's done in, um, in confidentiality. So they write, write them down and slide them over because you don't have to admit to me why that's a challenge. Um, but it's important that I know, right? And as, the, um, as I flip out, I hand out another card for them to write on, that's the please list. And the please list is, here's things I want to have in our game. I want to have, uh, it, sometimes they're like, uh, I want to have werewolves. I want to have werewolves and vampires. I just read Twilight. It was awesome. And I want to have a werewolf vampire battle. And it's sweet. I may not be able to promise that we're going to do that, but thank you for advocating for yourself. Um, and some of these things are great. Once again, the, you know what kind of game your players want to play, then you can make that game more engaging for, the, for that group of players. Please can also be an opportunity to like, advocate for the, kinds of, the kind of game that you want to do. If you say, I want to do a lot of role playing, character interaction. Um, that can be a great place to put it. You can put it on your please list. Let's have a lot of that. Or I want to have a lot of combat. I want to be really epic. Um, awesome. That's a great place to, to put it onto your please list. Another thing that we um, advocate for, I mentioned Session Zero is a great place to have that. Um, Check-ins are a great way uh, as an ongoing tool for you as a game master or you as the players to be able to voice your concerns and get your, get your needs heard and responded to. So we have in our groups, we have check-in questions and check-out questions. Um, the check-out questions are really the where I would suggest game masters and players do something like this. So at the end of every single session, we ask our players, what is a spotlight? 
What is something that someone else did that enhanced the game in some way? And that is an opportunity for players to say, hey, I really liked it when you made that joke. Or I really liked it the way that you healed me, or used healing word to save me. Whatever the case is, it's an opportunity to build relationships and encourage people to say what they appreciate that other, people, other players did. It doesn't have to be something their characters did. It could be something that, uh, that a person did at the, ta at the table that made them feel welcome. I really appreciated how uh, you refilled my water glass, whatever the case is. And we also ask, what is something that was challenging today? or something that you learned today. And ours, our uh, groups are oriented towards social skill enrichment, so that's largely why that question is in there. But it's a great time for game masters to say, what do you wish had gone differently? What is something you wish had happened that didn't happen, or something that happened that you wish didn't happen or had happened differently? Really, really valuable, because you can talk about that in-game or out of game. I really didn't like it when I was role-playing with that character, with the game master's character, that uh, you kept talking over me. Or you kept looking at your spell book and telling the other person next to you that fireball spell and how much damage it did. I was, I was kind of bothered by that because I was role playing with my long lost brother, whatever. Um, those kinds of things are really important because otherwise that player doesn't know. So it's, it's really valuable to create a designated space for that so that if something comes up in the game, you'll know I can talk about it at the checkout. We don't have to interrupt the game to make it happen. It's designated every single session we have an opportunity to talk about it. The third one, one of my absolute favorites. What do you predict will happen next? Because secretly, I steal ideas from this. <laughs> a lot. We do that a lot. <laughs> um, and uh, this is good because our sessions are 90 minutes, and we try to end on some degree of cliffhanger. And so it's good about goal setting. I really, I really think we're going to finally beat this bad guy. And if I plan to have the bad guy, you know, 10 weeks later be the final boss, and they're like, I'm really ready to fight the bad guy, then I will know that and I'll adjust the game accordingly. But also, if there's like, I think that shopkeeper was uh, part of a death cult. <laughs> okay. Okay. Yeah. Shopkeeper is suddenly a part of a death cult. Um, before we, we're going we're gonna to transition and, and get a chance to answer some questions. Before we answer questions, there's a mic right up here. So if you have a question, you can start lining up for that. And we're going to tell you while people are lining up about an upcoming project that we're really excited about. Um, and that if you are interested in using games for social skill development or if you're interested in just playing a game that, where you're really trying to make for a better table experience, um, this may be a good tool for you. So we've been doing this, uh, our work, for about eight years now. Um, and we are coming to Kickstarter on Tuesday is, yeah, it's crazy, it's crazy. Um, <laughs> is Critical Four. So this is basically going to be a take-home kit for parents and teachers and therapists who've never played RPGs before um, to have a slimmed down, stripped down rule set to get them instantly in introduced into RPGs. Um, but also a module and a facilitator's guide specifically oriented at social skill building. Um, we've been uh, de in development for this for God, like three years now. Um, and we're really, really excited to, to be moving forward with it and, and to be um, garnering support. So um, on Tuesday, Please come Kickstart this project. <laughs> it's yes. a lot of work to yes. run a Kickstarter. Um, and, uh, and we want to make sure that this gets into as many people's hands as possible. We want to see more um, groups cropping up around the world where people are playing the game for the benefit of others um, or are playing the game in order to help them grow and improve uh, their lives and the lives of other people. Um, so uh, your support means a lot in being able to get this into as many hands as possible. And even if you, you already have a game you love, you don't need the sim simplified, stripped-down rules. We're going to have a facilitator's guide in there that talks about a lot of the things we talked about today, about how to structure a game to help people grow. Um, with that, let's have our first question. Hey, um, I work with kids and teens with AC, um, and one of the things that is really helpful is to have So some of that can be um, sort of fostered and facilitated as you are, um, uh, this, this is a, a scaffolding issue. Um, what you're trying to do is you're trying to foster the opportunity to be more imaginative. Um, oftentimes we see a lot of teenagers who are um, really integrated into video games, and so they haven't really had the opportunity to really flex those imagination muscles. Um, the thing that we want to do in order to help make that 
uh, a, a good chance for them to be excited about it is to paint situations where they can really do anything. Where I'm gonna yes and whatever it is that you put in front of me. Um, uh, and in that way, they, they get an opportunity to, get to be excited about using imagination. Um, when, I, when they say, are there chandeliers in this inn? And I go, of course there are chandeliers in this inn. Uh, and they say, I have cut down the one that's right above the big bad guy. And I say, yes, there's absolutely one above the big bad guy, even though I never described that before, and even though I never uh, painted that opportunity before. Now it is there because you are using your imagination, because I want to encourage that, that interaction. Um, another way to do it is, is as you're scaffolding it, um, minis are a great way to, to start off on that process. I can picture that this is my character, um, and then that gives me the opportunity to imagine how my character is swinging their sword, how my character is shooting their bow, what the spell looks like. So you can, you can build in the smaller descriptions that they're going to do in order to input into the world, uh, in order to sort of encourage the opportunity for imagination. I also stay in character. Like to kind of an annoying degree sometimes, <laughs> um, where like they'll ask me questions and I'll answer it as the character. Like I don't know what spells you have. <laughs> Why would I know that? I'm just a shopkeep. I once watched Adam. We had a, a group of um, new eight-year-olds um, in a game, and Adam was playing a, a soup. A soup. We have a lot of soup in our games. Um, he was playing a soup kitchen uh, server uh, person, the chef, uh, and uh, the players basically said like, "I punch him." Uh, and Adam just stayed in character the entire time. Who, who, who are you punching? I'm the only one here. <laughs> and they were you, like, no, I'm, I'm oh, punching my Oh, fist. you want a fist bump. Okay. <laughs> That's how you fist bump. It's a little softer than that. <laughs> now you know. Let's fist um, bump. And it works brilliantly <laughs> because at some point the joke just becomes like, apparently he's just not going to respond to Adam. He's just going to be in character the entire time. The whole time. time. Adam's now going to answer all the yeah. remaining questions in this As character. Sheamus. <laughs> <laughs> who wants some soup? Um, go ahead. <laughs> Oh man! Um, oh God, there's there's lots of really good moments. Um, okay, so the Bia Gothma story is a puzzle we've actually used multiple times. Um, in one particular instance, um, we set up the whole thing, the, the troll of legend. The way the actual puzzle works is that um, you walk into the room, and in one corner you can see the troll of legend. He's behind bars, Bia Gothma. And in the other corner of the room, you see three unlabeled levers um, that you can sort of, sort of pull, like those um, uh, Dr. Frankenstein levers. Um, and then across the, the very end of the room, you can see a, a metal door that is sealed shut. And so the way the puzzle works is that you have to talk to Biagathma, and he knows which lever opens the door, but obviously he's probably going to lie to you. And so you have to sort of figure out, um, if I pull two of these levers, it lets Biagathma free. But if I pull the, the third one, the correct one, it will open the door across the way. So in this particular instance, we had one player who was playing a character who they described as incredibly impulsive, um, and it was an appropriate character for them to play. Um, they, uh, they came into the room, and we had all the other players sitting down at the table, and I introduced the whole room, um, and you could see all the other players, like, pulling out their notebooks and going, oh, okay, so, so it's three, three levers, and, like, trying to figure out, they're designing a matrix, and then my impulsive player says, I run across the room and I pull all three levers like this. <laughs> And so in that moment, uh, all of a sudden I was like, Bia Gafma is now free. Um, <laughs> he runs across the room, he grabs the player, getting ready to eat them, and all the other players are like in stunned silence. <laughs> um, and I said, well, the door is open. You can leave your fellow teammate here to be eaten by Bia Gafma and release this troll of legend upon the world. Or you can try to save them. And they had to sit down and really debate and talk about it. <laughs> but they decided, ultimately, that they were going to save their teammate. Um, so uh, Bia Gafma, in this particular story, really loved eating children. Um, so one of them, the dwarf, uh, posed as a child and stood in the, ca in the cage area and pretended to be a, a much more delicious child for, for Bia Gafma to eat and lured him back into the cage where they flipped all the levers again uh, and re-imprisoned Bia Gafma in the cage. But the, the real turning point to that, aside from it being hilarious, was, um, was that, that at the end of that game when we did our checkout, um, one of the players said, I'm really glad that you did that 
because I sometimes really struggle with being impulsive and making decisions without thinking about them. And seeing you do that reminds me that this is a skill we're all working on and it's something that I'm working on here and that's why we're here at this group. Um, and that player, the impulsive player said, um, I'm super glad that you guys can now help my character become less impulsive and I'm gonna rely on you to help them, help them make those changes and strides. So it was, it was an awesome opportunity for the group to come together when it could have broken them apart. I'm going to save my story because that was a good story and I don't want to follow that. <laughs> um, go Next ahead. question. send us an email because we're actually you're not the first teacher who's asked us for that so we're in partnership with Ethan Schoonover who runs the Lake Washington Girls Middle School uh, Dungeons class. and Dragons class okay. um, to create that very thing so other teachers can start using that so make sure you send us an email because we can talk about uh, strengths and a lot of the stuff we talked about here around like here are the skills the kids are going to have um, but one of the main things that we've learned and we learned this the hard way when we first started off with the organization we ran before Game to Grow was a lot of people don't care about the game you're playing um, what they care about is the skills they're going to build and what that's going to do for the outcomes that they care about. So we, we went to go speak to a PTA to talk to a principal, and we were like, Dungeons & Dragons is this awesome game, and uh, everyone's just dice, and there's characters, and there's like dragons, and dungeons, and it's cool. And the principal was like, God, uh, thanks for your time, and kind of sho shoved us out the door. So we had to really learn that our passion for this thing is fantastic, but the language we use has to be the language that they need to hear. So we learned that speaking to, to principals and teachers, a lot of it was about staying in school. A lot of it was about building relationships that improve their, their ability to be in school group projects. The collaboration skill, very valuable. Frustration tolerance, they're not leaving the room, flipping the table when there's something unexpected happening. Um, that's the language that I would recommend you use to talk to your principal. Um, as far as like getting skills as a new dungeon master, um, my best recommendation would be to, to play an adventuring, adventures league game. Um, even just being a player, getting to, to really see what it is, and take notes. Um, see what your dungeon master does. See what you like and what you don't like. Um, uh, it's, it takes a long time. I, I, I've been playing since I was 10. Adam's been playing a similar length of time. Like, it, it takes a long time to bu build skills as a dungeon master. Um, the other recommendation I'll make is Sly Flourish's Return of the Lazy Dungeon Master's Guide, um, which is an amazing resource um, and uh, is totally a worthwhile resource for any dungeon master to utilize um, in building their, their repertoire of, of skills to help kind of ease the transition of being a dungeon master. We also do consultations. So if you go to our website, you can sign up for one. Um, we can talk. Yeah. Um, that's a gigantic question, because um, it changes a lot. Um, our games look very, very different for eight-year-olds than 18-year-olds. Um, and a lot of that has to do with how much we introduce and scaffold the silliness, because eight-year-olds are ready for me to be in character that whole time, and it's kind of frustrating but cute. And 18-year-olds don't always have as much patience with my characters. As well as um, sometimes the skills we're working on, a, a lot of the stuff we're talking about here is, is a little bit more in-depth. Sometimes the skills we're working on is like, sit still. <laughs> um, let somebody else talk without interrupting them. Like those are a lot of really valuable skills and when you're eight and you have not had a lot of opportunity to be around peers or friends, um, sometimes those are the skills you really need to, to do. I think unfortunately that, that needs to be our, our last question because I think we're, we're out of time. I think we're just about out of time. We will be outside there for a little while. They'll probably kick us out of here, but we'll be out there answering questions. Please go to criticalcore.org and sign up for our mailing list and kick back us on Kickstarter. And thank, thank you, you so, so much, much everybody. everybody.